Thank you for your blessings on us. I pray that you touch us now and help us to rightly divide the word of God. I pray that you use us for your will, and I pray that you'll use this message to be a help and encouragement to some Christian. Lord, I pray that you'll save that sinner that's nearest hell, wherever they are. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 1. It said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. And then in Hebrews chapter number 12, the Bible says in verse number 1, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. If God will help us for a little while, we want to preach on our faith. Our faith. We've looked at the faith of the Old Testament saints, and we looked at the faith of these others uh, mentioned in the past in Hebrews chapter number 11. We looked at the faith of Isaac, and the faith of Enoch, and the faith of uh, Jacob, and all of those. And now we want to look at our faith, what's laid here in Hebrews chapter number 12. Probably about impossible to preach out of Hebrews chapter number 11 without dealing at least with the first two verses of Hebrews chapter number 12. And so if God to help us, won't look at our faith. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race set before us. First thing I want to notice in verse number 1 is we have here in Hebrews chapter number 12 uh, the experience of the cloud. We notice the experience of the cloud or even the education that the cloud gives us. He said here, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Who, are the, who is that cloud of witnesses? What is the cloud of witnesses? Uh, you see here that there is a race that that's mentioned and the cloud of witnesses would be those that are not only observing the race but have also run the race in the past and know how to run the race and have experience running the race and they're encouraging those that are in the race to go on and to press on and to be patient and to keep going and I think about how you can look at all types of different sports and you've got coaches and former players on the sidelines encouraging one another to continue to go on because they've experienced before. I'm glad that you and I as the people of God, we can draw from the experience of these clouds this cloud and we can look back and see that though some of them failed, some of them fa failed. I think of Samson, how he failed, and how that uh, da David, he failed God in certain areas of his life, and every one of them has, has some type of failure. And some of them falter, by the way, and stumble as they're going along. And then, But I'm glad that you can notice that God was still faithful, and God was still able to do that which he had called them to do, and to help them to do that which he had called them to do. And I can draw from their experience and know that though I mess up and though I falter and though I fail, God's still faithful to help me to do that which he'd have me to do. So we see the experience and the education of the cloud and I'm thankful that God doesn't just record the good things about people. I'm glad that in the past in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament he records men's faults and men's failures so that we might understand that there is redemption, there is a remission and there is a way that you can go before God and get forgiveness and God doesn't cast you aside as a failure and say I'm done with you but God takes and prunes his, his, uh, his plants and shears the sheep and helps you and I to go on for God and I'm glad of that though I fail and though I falter God's still faithful I'm thankful the word of God said I write these things unto you uh, that you sin not but if any man sin we have an advocate with the father 
Jesus Christ the righteous. I am glad of that. But I also notice not only the experience or the education of the cloud, but I also notice the endurance of the Christian. Look at what he said. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race set before us. There's an endurance to the Christian life, an endurance to the walk. It's going to cost you some things. I notice he teaches us in verse number one to lay aside selfishness. He said, put aside every weight. He didn't say it was sin. He didn't say it was anything wrong. He didn't say it was anything unacceptable. But there's some things you and I just need to be willing to set aside. Good jobs are wonderful. I'm thankful for America and the American dream and all that. But I'm telling you, you and I as the people of God need to lay aside some of those opportunities that are put before us through the uh, privileges we have in this country and just decide and determine that we're going to follow God. Nothing wrong with a good paying job. Nothing wrong with having a good house and a good a good family. But you and I need to understand we need to lay aside every weight. Anything that's going to slow you down for God needs to be dealt with, needs to be put aside so we might be faithful in our endurance race that we have before us. Not only do I notice the lay aside selfishness, but he also said to lay aside sin. He said put aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. There's some things that you and I struggle with on a daily basis. You have a particular sin and it seems like it's just the easiest one to mess up in. It's the easiest one that comes most natural to you and it's a sin that seems like any time the devil comes by with that temptation you end up failing and faltering in your walk with God. And we need to lay aside that sin that easily besets us. Seek the face of God. The Bible tells us there's no temptation which has taken you such except that which is common to man. He said, but with every temptation he'll make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. He will not remove the temptation but if we'll seek the face of God, he will give us the ability and the willingness and the uh, uh, the avenue to bear that temptation and to not fail and falter in that temptation. I heard a man of God say this one time. He said, if you like banana pudding before you got saved, chances are you like it after you got saved. If you was a drunk before you got saved, chances are you could be a drunk while you saved. You could get back in to that sin. And I do find it interesting that so many people preach that the people of God, once they're saved, are free, completely free from sin, and they never sin again. And yet, for some reason, the apostle had to tell the people at the Hebrew, uh, the, the Hebrew people, the children of God, uh, children of God that are saved, had to tell them that they're not to sin. If you cannot sin, nobody has to tell me not to be purple. Nobody has to tell me not to be blue. Nobody has to tell me not to be a woman, because I'm not those things. But God told the people of God not to sin, because they were capable and they were able to sin. But he tells us to lay aside the sin that does so easily beset us. Whatever that sin is that you struggle with, I challenge you and the Holy Spirit of God to help you. Try to memorize scripture that deals specifically with that sin. Try to memorize things that will help you to withstand that temptation and be able to bear it. I find the example, or not the example, but the experience of the cloud, I find the endurance of the Christian lay aside selfishness, lay aside sin, but also this, he told us, and run with patience the race set before us. We need to be steadfast. We need to be steadfast. He said be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of God. There needs to be something that you do for the cause of Christ. God doesn't save people to sit on the church pew. God doesn't save people just to sit at their home and read their Bible. God saves people to give them a job and give them something to do. The Bible tells us how that God gave a garden unto, he, uh, unto Adam to till and to plant that garden and to keep that garden. Say that just came with sin. No, there was work to be done in the garden before sin. And he's made us to work now. And he's going to make us work in the millennial reign. We'll have a job to do and we'll reign with him and we'll labor with him in that millennial reign. God has a designed mankind to work and God has
has designed to work for every Christian and a race for every Christian. He's got something for you to do. And if you're not doing anything, chances are you've not sought the face of God or you're living in rebellion before God. We see the endurance of the Christian. We're to be steadfast. We're to lay aside selfishness, lay aside sin, and be steadfast. He said, and run the race, run the race with patience, uh, run with patience the race set before us. There's something for you to do that's before you, that's right there in your grasp. There's always something to do. I think about my employer, how uh, he taught me, uh, Brother Rusty Jones taught me how to work and uh, taught me a skill and a trade and uh, taught me how to read a tape measure and taught me how to do some carpentry work. And, but more than that, him, along with my parents, taught me a worth ethic and said, there's always something to do. Don't make a wasted trip going from the job to the truck. Carry something out with you. There's always something to do. And as the child of God, there's always something to do. There's a race set before us. I see the experience of the cloud, the endurance of the Christian, but they all say this lastly, the example of Christ. The example of Christ. In verse number 2, he said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We see the example of Christ. He didn't say that these, this cloud was an example to us. He said they'll witness. They testify. They testify that God's faithful. But I'm not supposed to live necessarily like Abraham lived. Abraham failed God. Abraham messed up. Abraham faltered. I'm not supposed to live like David in every aspect of his life. I'm sure not supposed to live like Samson lived. But I'm supposed to realize and get encouragement that God is faithful. But my example that is set before me is Christ. He said, looking unto Jesus. Let me notice a few things about the example of Christ. First of all, we see that he is the goal. He is the goal. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the goal. He's the one. He's the life that we're supposed to pattern our life after. Yes, I fail and falter. Yes, I will never obtain it. But if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And if I aim at perfection, I'll be far closer than I would be if I didn't aim at all. I'm thankful that God is our goal. The Old Testaments look forward to the coming of Christ. Them saints at cloud, they ran with patience, waiting for Christ to come, looking for Christ to come. And we're supposed to run with patience looking that Christ has come and looking at the example that is laid before us and realize that he is our goal. He said to live is Christ and to die is gain. He is our goal. Not only the example of Christ, he's our goal, but also he is the God of heaven. He is the goal and he is the God of heaven. He said the author and finish of our faith. He started this thing and he finished this thing. He started the faith and he'll finish the faith. He started this world and he'll finish this world. He started all that is. He'll finish it all in the fullness of time. And I'm thankful of that. Not only is he the God of heaven, but also he's the gospel. Looking unto Jesus, he's our goal, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the God of heaven who for the joy that was set before him endured this cross despite and the shame. Not only is he the goal and the God of heaven, but he's also the gospel. He endured the cross. We have no message outside of Christ. The Muslims outside of Muhammad still have a message. And the Buddhists outside of Buddha still have a message. And the, the Mormons with outside of Joseph Smith, they still have a message. But you and I as the people of God have no message without Jesus Christ. Without, he said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And we have no message without Jesus Christ. You can think about socialism. Socialism, they still have a message without their founders, without the marksmen, without, uh, although I can't remember their names, but those that started that and the communists without Joseph Stalin and all them others, they still got a message and you got the capitalists even without our forefathers, they still got a message. But Jesus Christ is the only message of the gospel. He's the only message of the Christian faith. He's the only message of the King James Bible. And he is our gospel. Not only is our gospel, but also he is the glory. We find, he said, looking unto 
Jesus. He's our goal, the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the God of heaven, and who, for the joy that is set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. He is the gospel, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the glory. I'm glad that Jesus Christ, I can't glory in anything outside of Jesus Christ. There's nothing good about me uh, but Jesus Christ saved me anyhow. There's nothing to be desired of me. I sit up here and I yell too much and scream and sweat and spit. There's nothing to be desired about me but there's a God in heaven that loves me and died for me and saved my wretched soul from hell and birthed me in the family of God and Filled me with the Holy Spirit of God. I'm thankful that I'm born again. Going to heaven. He is the glory. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue shall confess. The things in earth and things under the earth. I'm glad he is the glory. The Bible tells us how. That the uh, Isaiah was in the house of God. And the year of the Lord. And the year that uh, King Uzziah died. And he said he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And saw all them angels, them cherubim, flying or seraphim, whatever they was, flying around the throne saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. He is the glory. He is the holiness of the saints of God. And he's my king. I'm thankful for that. Our faith, our faith, we can draw encouragement and experience and education from the cloud. They failed and faltered, but they showed that God was faithful. And then there's the endurance of the Christian faith. The endurance of the Christian walk. We need to lay aside selfishness and sin and be steadfast in what we're doing for God. Then also there's the example of Christ. He is the goal. He is the God of heaven. He is the gospel. And he is the glory. Lord, I thank you for your blessings on us. I pray that you'll touch this feeble message. Lord, use it to the glorification of yourself. I pray that you'll save some sinner and encourage some saint of God to get to work for God. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Teach me, O oh Lord, to preach like John and to baptize one by one. John was a Baptist and I am a Baptist too.